next, we have Dr. Terry Odom, a Northwestern material chemical professor. Today, she will be discussing her work on the creation of nanoscale materials that not only amaze in their minuscule size, but their optical properties and biological nanostructs. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Terry Odom. Great, thank you. Um, I think I need to sh share my screen. If I share mine, does that take over from Jane? Let's try it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. I'm always amazed at these, um, how dedicated you students are to having um, learning experiences over the weekend. I think the last time that I, I participated in this uh, amazing discussion, it was on a Sunday right before Memorial Day. And then the students were actually just a tiny bit embarrassed that they were hosting all of these uh, discussions with, uh, with scientists. But um, I'm just amazed that you can do that and you're so far ahead in, uh, in your uh, thinking about science than I ever was, as will become crystal clear. <laughs> Okay, so let me get started. Um, let me actually put my own timer so that I can, I would like to have enough time for discussion. So uh, I, I talked to Diana about what maybe I could emphasize and I thought I could highlight some of the science that we've been involved in, but also the journey. I feel like some of the journey is almost as equally important as the scientific contributions. You've heard a little bit of this from, uh, from Jane earlier. So I titled it, uh, Follow the Nano Brick Road. Hopefully that rings some bells on old favorites. Um, but really it's, um, I consider my journey about the story of us, meaning there are a lot of people that are involved in either making you as a person or in contributing to a discovery. And I just wanted to share a little bit about those people with you. Um, first on their training of me as a scientist and then second, their training uh, and mentoring of me as a professor, because these are two totally different things. Okay, so there's, um, there's a visionary that invited us to think about nanoscience, um, Richard Feynman, and he gave this famous speech, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And he says, people tell me about miniaturization and how far it has progressed today. They tell me about electric motors that are the size of the nail on your small finger. And there's a device on the market, they tell me, by which you can write the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pen. But that's nothing. That's the most primitive halting step in the direction I intend to discuss. It is a staggeringly small world that is below. And in the year 2000, when they look back at this age, they will wonder why it was not until the year 1960 that anybody begins seriously to move in this direction. Why cannot we write the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pen? And part of the answer to that, of course, is what uh, the previous speaker already introduced to us. We needed to be able to manipulate atoms and molecules one by one at the nanometer scale. But also what was interesting about 1960, and I'll talk about this uh, towards the end of the talk, is that this is when the, the laser was invented. And so the laser um, is, is an amazing uh, uh, light amplified stimulated emission of radiation, but nobody knew what to do with it when it was invented. So it was uh, a solution uh, looking for a problem, but now lasers are of course ubiquitous and we can't imagine modern life or modern communications without them. So I wanted to give some historical context to the development of nanoscience and nanotechnology. So around in the year 400, the Romans um, and their artisans uh, produced this uh, beautiful cup, which is called the Lycurgus cup. And if you look at it on your desktop, you're going to see this, um, uh, uh, the light looks green as it's reflected. If you put a light bulb inside, it looks red. So that was interesting. Why do you get two different colors depending upon where the direction of light is? And then in 1856, Michael Faraday, who's a famous British scientist, was interested in a concept called finely divided gold, and what we, uh, which we now call as uh, nanoparticles, but he kept notebooks of this, as you can see in these uh, boxes. And he was trying to understand uh, what these structures looked like, but the tools were not yet developed. 
Okay, and then we go to 1959, which was uh, Feynman's famous talk. And then in 1986, the Nobel Prize was awarded for two tools. One of them you've already heard about, scanning tunneling microscopy, which is the top image, to be able to manipulate atoms one by one. And, and then the manipulation of the atoms in, in this way on a metal surface, they were able to create these, uh, what are called quantum corrals, standing waves of electrons. And in the bottom image, uh, the second uh, instrument that received the Nobel Prize in 1986 was the transmission electron microscope. So you're using electrons to image um, materials. And it's these types of materials, it's an alloy of silver and gold that actually are from the composition of this cup. So it wasn't until a long time later that we really understood uh, what was um, contributing to these beautiful colors. In 1996, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of C60, of Mr. Fullerene. And in the year 2000, um, for the United States, Bill Clinton, uh, President Bill Clinton launched the National Nanotechnology, Nanotechnology Initiative, which provided dedicated funds to the development of the nanoscale tools and materials. In 2007, the Nobel Prize was given for giant magneto uh, resistance. This is again related to some of these magnetic properties that was introduced earlier. And then in 2008, a new type of prize uh, was introduced called the, the Kavli Prize. Um, the founder of this prize was interested in highlighting modern uh, advances. And one of those advances areas are in nanoscience. And so the two materials or two structures that were first awarded the, the Kavli Prize is for semiconducting uh, quantum dots, such you can see here, taken by a transmission electron micrograph. And again, these materials are in um, some OLED uh, sort of uh, light emitting diode displays that you can buy from Samsung and LG today. And in the bottom image is a carbon nanotube um, and you can resolve the atomic structure using scanning tunneling microscopy. So the idea of the, the tools and the materials all developing in tandem, it's really uh, an exquisite type of dance. So if we go to the beginning, um, where we talk about nanoscale gold, which I introduced to you in the Lacurgis cup, as well as uh, Michael Faraday's extensive lab notebooks. And then where do we go today related to what I call the, the nano brick road made of gold nanostructures? Okay, but we have to go back sort of to the very beginnings of it all. And um, unlike you who are have identified that you're interested in STEM and you're, you wanna make connections with um, world leaders and in these areas, I was not that. <laughs> so I was, um, I was on the slow track to, to develop in, in science and I have evidence because my parents recently are um, cleared out their, uh, their storage and they wanted me to see if I wanted to keep anything or not. And I just came across these, um, these old uh, collections that for some reason they kept. And so this sounds pretty good. Uh, dear parents, we are delighted to inform you that uh, Terry Wang qualified for the gifted program by meeting criteria. So it sounds pretty good. But then it's an asterisk, so it's only admitted on a, on a trial basis. <laughs> and that was probably really good reason for this. So um, I can read this here based on the student's involvement please circle the number which represents your perception of the following items on a scale of one to six where one is low. And you see that I have a lot of low scores. So that's not so good. But I persevered and about you know, six months later, the scores uniformly moved up by two units. So I think that's that was pretty good and it was enough. <laughs> so, um, the, the teacher said that I should be commended for my progress in math and I should also be encouraged to take higher math courses as I move up into higher grades and, and college. So, you know, you start off a little bit slow and then you can uh, make some adjustments as, as you go. So we made some adjustments and, um, and then we did go to college. And college was a very uh, formative time in my life. Um, it was really a time that uh, introduced me to science um, and moreover to multidisciplinary science. 
meaning all of these different fields all together were going to be really important into making me into the scientist who I've become today. So I went to school at Stanford University and probably the most influential person there was my uh, then boyfriend, now husband. Um, we were married in college. Um, and part of the reason um, he was so instrumental in how I thought about science is he was a year ahead of me and he introduced this uh, experiment called Young's Double Slit Experiment, which was originally done with light, um, where it was the, an example of how small particles, such as electrons or photons, they can also behave as waves. So light and matter, um, small enough, can have both uh, wave-like properties and particle-like pro properties. And moreover, this experiment was the first beginnings of, of interference and also the quantum mechanical nature of electrons and, and photons. So this idea of trying to understand what's happening at, at small length scales sort of caught me from the very beginning. Um, but then of course, these are great ideas, but then you need to take the courses. And um, I started off as a chemical engineer. And so I was taking um, courses uh, by this professor, Professor uh, Reggie Mitchell. He was in the mechanical engineering department. And I remember him quite a bit because I spent a lot of time, like a lot, a lot of time in his office hours. And um, he was very patient with me and he basically encouraged me to keep trying. <laughs> Part of me was just wanting to give up the whole engineering track altogether, but um, he gave me a lot of confidence and someone, one of the first professors, I think that actually believed in me, which, uh, which meant a lot. Um, the second person that uh, was um, important in my experience was a, a physicist. This is Professor Bob Laughlin. And part of the reason he um, uh, had so much influence is I was a chemist, chemistry major, and then I ended up taking his statistical mechanics course and then um, he was surprised that uh, that chemist <laughs> could do so well in, in the course. So I thought, well, something is going right here. That's pretty good. And then finally, uh, the chemist, chemist, um, uh, uh, Professor Mike Thayer, where he gave me a chance. So he had not uh, for a long time had undergraduate students carrying out research in his lab. And he saw that I did well in his graduate quantum mechanics course. And so he invited me to, uh, to participate, which was um, an amazing experience. And so I sort of highlight them as the titles because um, in a lot of the work that we do now, which I didn't know at the time, we integrate all of these ideas, engineering, uh, physics, uh, chemistry, and, and now some biology. And so which led me to uh, back to this quantum corral picture that I showed you earlier where the scanning tunneling microscopy tip manipulated individual atoms into a ring. So you could see these uh, standing waves of, of electrons. Um, so at that time, I was like, this is really interesting. I'd like to know more, maybe contribute more. Um, and then we had a decision to make. So th the choice was, should we go into the, the Peace Corps right after graduating college, or should we go to graduate school? Um, either one would have been a, a very good option for us. What helped us make the decision was that this was one of the times in recent memories that we the government shut down. And so uh, when the government shut down, national parks were closed, offices to do these uh, interviews for Peace Corps were also closed, and so since we needed to make a decision sooner rather than later, then we went to graduate school. And graduate school also was the, the time that really trained me into becoming a scientist. And so uh, Charlie Lieber was my advisor. Part of the reason I was interested in working with him is because he had built one of these scanning tunneling microscopes and he was using it to um, image and manipulate uh, different types of materials. And my during my uh, second year in, in graduate school, we were able to uh, correlate the atomic structure of single walled carbon nanotubes with their electronic properties. Meaning depending on how you roll up this uh, honeycomb structure, you can have uh, all carbon nanotubes be either a metal like copper or a semiconductor like silicon. 
And so this was um, unprecedented at the, at the time. And so we wanted to, to learn more about that. So I was really lucky. I was at the right time uh, in the right place uh, and the science was just, just getting ready to, to bust out at the nanoscale. Um, but this time was also formative, not just for the intellectual achievements and, and advancements, um, but related to people that had influence on me. And so um, uh, there are all sorts of ways to, to grow as uh, a person. And Dave Schmelzer was the uh, lead pastor uh, of a church that I was a part of in, in Cambridge. And he challenged us to think about um, more. <laughs> how can you contribute more? Um, and how can you listen to God on how to do that? So I thought that was um, an important question and something that we uh, still think about. But then you also have friends that are pushing you um, emotionally on how and why do you make the choices that you do and are you going in a right direction for personal growth? So the ability to have uh, a tight network of people that hold held me accountable for things, I think was uh, really important for, for my development as a person and my development as a scientist. So I was about four years into my uh, doctorate, my PhD, and then I was, it was time to graduate and I had no idea what I wanted to be doing with my life. So um, one thing that I had seriously considered was to become a dog walker, partly because I love dogs and I couldn't have a dog where we lived in our, um, in our small uh, condo. And I thought, surely I can do this for a little bit because I didn't have a plan. So it's not, it's not the best option. I tell my own students not to do as I, as I did. And I try to provide them feedback along the way for them to make uh, some informed uh, choices and decisions on their future. But this is, this is where I was, late bloomer in this way as well. But then there was an opportunity um, at Northwestern University where I currently am uh, uh, the chair as well as professor where um, Mark Ratner and, and Chad Merkin reached out to, to my advisor and said, do you have anybody about, you know, almost about to finish up in their uh, PhD that might be interested in becoming a faculty member? And if so, uh, send, have them uh, come interview. And so uh, I did interview and it was not the best interview. Um, I didn't really know much, um, very, very naive but um, they were willing to take a chance on me. And it was also something that um, I was quite interested in thinking about in terms of opportunities because I had never thought of becoming a professor. I didn't really like the academic environment. I felt like people were unnecessarily uh, mean to each other. Um, but uh, when I interviewed at Northwestern, it seemed like, and it is true that people really enjoyed each other's uh, company. So. So we decided to try that. Okay, so Brian is still uh, part of the, the journey, um, journey uh, stage two, we decided to, to try that. And he, he's made different, an interesting choice because um, as I mentioned, he was a year older than me in college, uh, but he waited for me to, to finish. And then we went to graduate school together. And so when I went to uh, Northwestern, he was willing to have me lead, go first, and then see if he could uh, find a position um, in the Chicago area. And, and he did. He's also a professor of, of physics at Northwestern. Um, so you still need partners and they still keep you honest. Um, and then I had a couple of mentors um, and these mentors were, um, they were not the gentle mentors. <laughs> they were sort of very blunt. And, and I think that was important for me to hear at the time, even though it wasn't pleasant, because I knew they were trying to be helpful and they weren't trying to be cruel. And uh, they shaped a lot how I think about science and what types of choices we would like to make. And then I have colleagues at Northwestern um, that have just, they're amazing. George Shads, Chad and, uh, and Mark Ratner. And then there are people that help you along the way. And um, this is Dan Linzer and I call him a helper because he was the provost. And so you always need administrators to help support what the, what the professors want to be doing. So when I moved to Northwestern, I had to learn when to take risks, meaning I was interested in nanoscience. I think I've shown you that already, but I was also interested in photonics. 
And when I started my career, I had a lot, I received a lot of advice not to take that risk. They told me, you don't know anything about photonics, no formal training, no informal training. Um, and I thought about, a lot about that, but I decided to continue that uh, in this area because I wanted to fail on my own terms. Either it was gonna work or it wasn't going to work. Um, and you have no idea if you stay the safe route, whether that will actually bring you to the place that, that you want. So we did it, we did it in, in, in photonics. And so I, we were able to explore ideas like optical corrals, or I showed you those quantum corrals where you saw standing waves of electrons. And uh, my uh, group was able to make optical corrals where you could see standing waves of, of light, standing waves of photons. We've been, we were able to make these uh, nanoscale uh, thin films made out of metal that also have, uh, that are perforated by holes. And it turns out each of these individual holes can squeeze out more light through their holes than the, geom than the geometric um, design would suggest. So it's a phenomenon called extraordinary optical transmission. And that's been really interesting to, to learn about and to contribute to um, sometimes uh, controversial and unexpected findings. Um, and this was the image that I showed uh, at the opening slide. We have developed a range of nanofabrication techniques to make three-dimensional structures that can also be functional. And so we have these uh, nanoscale uh, pyramids uh, that you can organize in this uh, really nice uh, uh, array. These structures can also be used as um, particles for uh, imaging and identifying cancer cells. Okay, and then we moved on to uh, what I call Nano uh, 2.0. So we had new additions. This is uh, my son, Bren Odom, when he was uh, just a baby and just a couple of months ago, he's almost eight. Um, and so the family expanded. Similarly, the group family uh, expanded. We had a range of students uh, from applied physics to material science and engineering, to biological sciences, to, to chemistry a range of students that are contributing to now interdisciplinary research. Um, and it's been a fantastic experience. So we can make structures with higher symmetries that can exist in, in nature for light trapping and solar cell devices. We can make these beautiful nanostars that can be used as um, uh, therapeutic uh, agents as well as a diagnostic particle. And we can also make these types of three-dimensional nanowrinkles that can be used for um, anti biofouling as well as super hydrophobic uh, surfaces. And all of these types of structures are, are possible because you have teams of people that are working together to solve these very complex problems. Okay, so and before I, I finish, I just want to give you two examples of some of the work that we have done with gold because we started out the, the talk with gold and also related to uh, collaborations that we've done. So some of our most meaningful work has been done as part of a team. Uh, and usually the collaborator brings in expertise to solve problems that neither they nor we could solve by ourselves. And these are my favorite types of problems to work on. They're usually complex and they're usually quite time consuming. But overall, um, these are the ones that, that uh, were the most inspiring. So we, we've been working with gold uh, particles and um, using them in different aspects in nanomedicine whether it's to um, say target uh, tumors and some type of precision uh, therapeutics, or um, like in this image here, to develop um, magnetic resonance imaging probes. And so we worked with um, Professor uh, Tom Ead at Northwestern University on this collaborative project, trying to determine whether if we attach um, DNA with gadolinium chelates. So the gadolinium is responsible for giving you the signal in the uh, MRI. If we attach them to different nanostructures, do we get a, a boost in the signal? So you, do you get higher contrast and more quickly if you were to use these in, in the clinic? And so what's interesting is that indeed you can see um, at, for example, at the 1.5 Tesla, that you have a very large enhancement if you put this um, molecular chelate on the gold star, which is the primary structure that we work with, versus if you leave them um, just on, on spheres. And so the structure and the shape make a big difference in the design of new types of materials. 
And similarly, this uh, overall signal is represents an 18 fold enhancement over what you use, um, or if you go to the doctors and you use Prohance, um, what are in conventional uh, uh, MRIs with contrast. So this was a very uh, fun project and, and we, we learned a lot both fundamentally and, and in the potential downstream applications. The other area that I wanted to highlight um, is uh, an engineering uh, project. So uh, the MRI contrast agents are more of a scientific project, collaborative project, but we've also been interested in, in lasers. I mentioned that this year is the 60th anniversary of the invention of, of the laser. And there are a range of different types of lasers that you can see here on the left hand side of the slide. This is a chemical laser. It's very, very large that can fit into a 747. Um, all the way down to uh, these uh, nanoscale lasers that are trying to be as small, for example, as a virus particle. But that's really, really difficult to do. And the way that um, the diffraction limit works is you shouldn't be able to do it. So the smallest lasers you should be able to make are about a micron. Uh, but in some work that we've done related to um, nanoscale lasers, you can see that um, this is what a traditional uh, lasing cavity looks like, but this uh, scanning electron micrograph is what our uh, nanoparticle cavities look like. These are super tiny, super tiny particles, and they trap the light and they localize the fields, as you can see in this cartoon, just around the, the particle surface. And so in this way, we can um, achieve the world's smallest lasers, and then we can also control the direction. So in a traditional case, the, the direction is dictated by you know, the perpendicular to the, the mirrors. But in this unconventional case that we have, we don't have any mirrors. And so you can rely on the geometry uh, of, the, of the lattice, uh, as well as the, the constituent materials making up the gain to achieve uh, direction, directionality, which is, pretty, which is pretty neat. And moreover, if you introduce, uh, put this in a microfluidic channel, you can control the, the wavelength of light that you get out just by keeping the, the nanoparticle structure the same. So it's a very um, interesting engineering project, but the fundamentals based on how the light is localized to around the particle uh, edges is really important. Okay, and then um, I've been also interested in, in using the expertise that we have for the, the public good. I had an opportunity to write uh, op-eds along these lines, and I was also teaching a, a course at the time. And so we wrote an op-ed on um, why altering the powdered donuts and the powdered donuts and Dunkin' Donuts would be bad for innovation. And so we had discussed this with my uh, with the students in this class, and they were freshmen. And this came in the last week of class. And I said, look, you've, you're now the resident experts in, in nano. Would you be interested in writing such an op-ed with me? And so we were able to, was able to train the students in critical thinking skills and scientific principles. And, um, and they agreed to, they would love to come help. And so we were able to publish this piece, uh, which was pretty neat. Um, and uh, with three students uh, contributing to the bulk of the, of the work. I was really proud of them for being able to, you know, they were freshmen, but they were resident experts and they had something to say. And then just uh, going to 2020, where there are new leadership roles as you evolve in your career. So I'm the chair of the Department of Chemistry at Northwestern University. Um, as you know, all in, in not being in school yet, and maybe some schools soon, is that it's been an experience um, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and it's been also an experience in trying to lead and provide some stability to organizations uh, in this time. So um, it's been hard, but it's also been rewarding on, on leading a, a very prestigious uh, department. And also in 2020, I assumed the role of chief editor at uh, one of the prestigious journals in nanoscience, it's called Nano Letters. And we also received a, a shout out from um, sort of our competitor, but I feel like we're all part of this uh, publishing community together to be able to, um, to continue to do uh, the best and publish the best work in nanoscience. And so uh, I just wanted to finish up by saying, why, why do you do what you do? Um, this was a question that I thought about 
I've, been, I've thought about it at some point for days, um, but it was part of an exercise uh, we did earlier. And there was this, uh, this, um, this beautiful song by Debbie uh, Friedman. And I think at the end of the day, um, playing the long game of everything that I've said yes to or no to, or made adjustments re related to that was to, you know, to be a blessing, to, to give, to make people better around me, <laughs> to, to change them, elevate them um, as part of a community. And that's what I've been uh, trying to do um, in my time here. Okay, so I will stop there. And I hope, I, I know I only left like two minutes for questions, but hopefully that'll be okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Adam. We really enjoyed your listening about your journey through nanotech. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, let me check the YouTube. I just wanted to ask because you said you had a late start to science in general. Like, how did you narrow your focus down to the nanoscale and working down there? How do I narrow it down? Yeah, like narrow, like, oh, I want to work with this. Yeah, I think, I think every, this is where everything matters. So in college, um, by taking different classes and engineering science, you know, physics and chemistry by having the breadth of education. And, and then the timing was just perfect because nanoscience is the integration of five to eight disciplines. And so it was, um, I wouldn't say it was a uh, happenstance, but the, the timing was just good. So when I've talked to students about what they might want to be doing with their lives, the, the ability to, um, to be as broad as possible in both science and engineering, as well as in more inclusive in your science. So like getting to know social scientists and how they think about things. I think that's really important because the, the human aspects of nanoscience and the times that you're living in now, you know, it's, <laughs> you can't escape it. I mean, COVID-19 vaccine should not be, uh, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a scientific problem, but it involves humans and, and decisions. And so I feel like if you can start learning about how people are receptive to things as well as do the best science possible I think there's huge impact there and that's what your generation will be able to do I mean right now we have to play catch up like my generation is like oh why can't people just believe in science but it's not yeah it's not so simple anymore all right thank you oh there's a question in the chat Oh. about Stanford. Would you recommend incoming freshmen? Oh, at Stanford, um, well, Stanford's pretty great because they have, uh, they force you to do this. Like your, your first year, you're in this mixed dorm and you have this great experience and you become very average, <laughs> right? You think you're mostly pretty okay by the time you get there, but then you find out you're just really average. And so by, I think that experience is really uh, important. But the other thing that Stanford does really well is they have a very good um, research abroad program or study abroad program, which I would highly recommend. I ended up doing that um, at Oxford for just a quarter. Um, and that was really important to see how other places do science, which is why, for example, even if you love your state and you love your university, you wanna do training in as many different places as possible because the, everyone's perspectives are just so different. All right, well, if there's no more questions, someone ask if there is a last minute question because otherwise we will move on. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's good to see you. Thank you, see so, you, and see thank you. you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Odom.